about a year ago, many of you heard me ask this question after the election. What if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb? What if this darkness is the darkness of the womb? Well, South Africa currently knows a lot of darkness. With up to 10 hours a day, we're scheduled power outages, businesses failing, additional traffic congestion due to traffic lights going dark, and the government seemingly walking up an escalator that's actually going down. Well, if it's going down at all, and if there's power. Crime and multiple failures of our criminal justice system. And one would be hard to find many people who would see this darkness as the darkness of the womb rather than the tomb. And this is not only true of South Africa, globally, we seem to be in a terminal stage of ruination. And the future does seem very dark. However, over the past few weeks, I've had an experience that shows the universe is friendly, as Einstein, I think, once remarked. One of my environmentalist friends, Fiona Maskell, had been prodding me to look at the work of Dougald Hein, who in 2011 was rated by a UK-based social innovation agency, Nesta, as one of the UK's 50 top radicals for his entrepreneurship and consciousness-raising writing on climate change. And together with another radical, Paul Kingsnorth, they wrote something titled Uncivilization, the Dark Mountain Manifesto. And this became a movement, a network of writers, artists, and thinkers who had stopped believing the stories that our civilization tells itself. Well, then about a month ago, it was either the divine mystery <laughs> or the YouTube algorithms that directed me to a video which featured Dougald talking about his book, At Work in the Ruins, Finding Our Place in the Time of Science, Climate Change, Pandemics, and all the other emergencies. So <laughs> that includes South Africa, <laughs> because we're very much in an emergency. So, well, that then in turn led me to another video featuring Dougald that also happened to have a friend of mine, Alistair McIntosh, on the panel. It was Dougal's book launch. As I was coming on my way here today, I, um, I took up a book which I read 20 years ago this spring, a book that one or two of you here might have heard of, called Soil and Soul. When I finished reading this book, I sat down and it's the only time I've ever really done this. I sat down immediately and wrote to the author. Um, and he very kindly <laughs> wrote back. And it's, it's among the handful of books that I can say, I don't know who I would be if I hadn't met this book. And I'm sure that there are other people in this room who know exactly what I'm saying. Well, let me tell you about Alistair McIntosh, because an amazing synchronicity of serendipity Alistair's also been the person who's been my inspiration. Alistair's a Scottish Quaker, a pacifist, a human ecologist, a liberation theologian, and writer of their book, Soil and Soul. It's subtitled People Versus Corporate Power. And that's really what got my attention. Because I was involved 20 years ago already in a classic battle between corporate power and an indigenous community on the Ponderland Wild Coast. And reading Alistair's book, it sent me on a whole new trajectory in my work, and it became a manual for guiding me in that work uh, to stop the mining of paradise, as I understood it. Well, I'm not going to go too much into that story. Just Google the word kolobeni, and you will have plenty to educate you about that. In short, a indigenous rural community has successfully stopped a government plan to mine the wild coast of titanium. Now, those of you who read Soil and Soul, it's a story about how in one crofter community uh, in the Hebridean Islands, the island of Egg, and in the island of Harrison Lewis, they similarly were able to assert their own self-determination. So there's this wonderful parallel story that's been happening in the north and in the south. So I you can see why I devoured it. Um, I came to know it actually through Alistair's wife, Verene, because she and I had a shared interest in the work of 
Anne Hope and Sally Timmel in the books and these manuals that she had done called Training for Transformation, a handbook for community workers, uh, which has become very helpful in my work in working to and using Paolo Freer's insights and Manfred Max Neff's insights latterly in terms of raising of community consciousness uh, and agency. So as I got to know Verena, she said, you know, my husband's got a lot of shared interests with you, as I were talking about institutions and organizations. Uh, so we made contact, and over the last 20 years, um, I find myself often getting hold of Alistair and saying, Alistair, we've hit this snag, we've hit this problem. What are your wisdom? How can we negotiate our way through this? And it's just been so exciting then to find Dougal, <laughs> similarly, with a similar experience. So Dougal and I trace our journey in consciousness and awareness to the shared epistemology with Alistair McIntosh, which he articulates so well. So if you want to understand Dougal and I, maybe go and read the book and get down more deeply into that. So we're going to talk about that and see what path the conversation takes. I'm not sure how it will end, but that's okay. I always try and be open to outcome, not attached to it, as Angelus Arian has guided me. But I thought I'd try and experiment this time. Uh, I've selected three images to try and capture the gist of my experience and have invited Dougal to do the same. And we will put these up and talk around them and see how that leads us. Uh, but before we do that, Dougal, your name has an interesting meaning. Tell us a bit about that and what influence Alistair actually had on you and why that was such a paradigm shifting experience for you. Oh, well, thanks, John. It's it's good to meet you. It's uh, I feel like we're both members of a um, a club of the, the Friends of Alistair, and it's a great club to be a part of. So yes, as you say, Dougald is an old Scottish name. It's a Gaelic name. Um, and uh, I spoke about this at that, at that event that you played the clip from in Glasgow because we were at the Golgale Trust. And the, the Golgale takes its name from this old 9th century word which referred to the inhabitants of the the part of the the Outer Hebrides where the Norse, the Vikings, had settled alongside the Gaels. And so the Gael is in Gaul Gael is from the, the Gaels, from the Gaelic. Um, the Gaul is a word that means stranger. So the Gaul Gaels were the stranger Gaels, the foreigner Gaels. And in the same way, the Gold and Dugald or Dugal, um, it's the same name with different different ways of writing it down, um, comes from that word, meaning stranger or foreigner. And the do is the word for dark or black. So to be called Dougald is to be a dark stranger or a swarthy foreigner or um, one or other of those things. <laughs> so, and, and since these days I live in Scandinavia, um, I felt rather appropriate to be arriving to take the book out into the world. Alongside Alistair and two other dear friends there at Golgale, and uh, to invoke that that set of Gaelic heritage that is there somewhere in the back of my my family. It was my my grandmother on my father's side who came from Scotland, so that's part of how I ended up with the name, I guess. <laughs> that's very interesting because appearances notwithstanding, I mean, we both looked like very much pale males. <laughs> both of us finding our way into which Alistair talks about an indigenization experience uh, as being a necessary almost rite of passage of connecting with, you know, traditional communities, people that have got a deeper sense of connection with the earth. And I hope we can talk a bit about that. But let's go back to that question which Valerie Kale started this with, because the synchronicity of you talking about the darkness and the dark. Um, then we, we hear this woman saying, is this darkness the darkness of the tomb or is this darkness the darkness of the womb? Now, how do you respond to that? Is it? 
Well, I think of the the old image that's there in the Bible, but there in many cultures as well, of the seed. You know, the seed falling into the ground unless the seed falls. So there is within the living world a pattern in which it's not necessarily an either or. The seed falling into the ground has to die in order for something new to grow and be born. And so perhaps um, you know, the, the image that's running through my book of hospicing modernity, which comes from my friend Vanessa Machado de Oliveira, whenever Vanessa and her friends in the Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures Collective speak about that, they always speak about it alongside the work of assisting with the birth of something new, unknown, and possibly but not necessarily wiser, and trying to make sure that we don't smother that new thing with our projections. And so rather than asking, is the darkness a darkness of the tomb or of the womb, perhaps what we're looking at is something that has aspects of both. There are things that have to die, and that's going to include a lot of pain. Mm. And that doesn't exhaust what's going on in this moment. It may also be that the ending of modernity and its stories is a sowing of seeds that get to grow in the dark soil and and bring new possibilities of life as well. Mm. Well, that clip that I took from Valerie Carr, it comes after she's talked of her experience of being with her mother on her deathbed. It's a, I refer people to that if they check the link because it was just so mind blowing to hear this uh, person explain how within the United States context, because she was talking about the elections and Trump and all the rest, mm. as a so called woman of color, or not from a Christian culture, from a Sikh experiencing and wanting to be a force for revolutionary love, as she calls it, and that's her movement. But let's get to your book, because what I've also sensed, and I, as a father, being a father myself, I want you to read a passage from it where you talk about your relationship with your son in the dark night of looking up at the stars. Can you read that passage for me, uh, and let's take it, take it from there. Sure. One evening in the first days of 2020, between the headlines of Australia burning and an assassination in the Middle East, my partner sees a story about a meteor shower that's due. Outside, the sky is clear, and I catch sight of one straight away, a bright flash traveling across the sky like a silent firework. So we pull out the sun lounger from my in-law's conservatory and lie under blankets, staring up. While we wait, my son wants to be told the names of the constellations. He's not yet five, but he knows there are two names for everything, Swedish and English. Even when these are only two ways of pronouncing names older than the languages we speak. Orion, Taurus, the Pleiades. The last time I saw the novelist Alan Garner, he told me there's new research on the resemblance between the Greek constellations and the figures seen in the sky by Aboriginal people in Australia. The similarities are strong enough to hint at common threads of myth leading deep into prehistory, stories carried out of Africa. How does it work when you wish on a falling star? My son wants to know. Does the thing you wish for just pop up out of the ground? His eyes are wide with recent memories of Father Christmas and the cartoons he's been getting to watch on his grandparents' TV. Suddenly, I understand why he was so keen on this impromptu astronomic outing. I'm going to wish for a Paw Patrol fire engine, he announces. I don't know how to disentangle myself or my family from this way of being, this web of extraction that surrounds us with objects that seem to pop up magically out of the ground. I don't even know how to frame the question how to name the work that's called for. 
It's not a problem, I remind myself. It's a predicament. One thing I know that helps, one piece of the work, is to gather and share the embers of other ways of being, blowing them gently into flame together, knowing how much unfinished history we bring to such encounters. As I listen to those who have more experience than I do of the ways life has been made to work in other times and places, one theme I hear is how much work goes into making a grown-up. It's not something you become by virtue of surviving childhood or sitting out enough years in schoolrooms and lecture theatres. When the time comes, it takes a work of initiation on which much of the life of your community is focused. You have to be cooked in the flames, I've heard it said. And the frame of initiation which your culture builds is the vessel that gives you a chance of coming through the fire. Well, I want to put up the first image that helped carry our narrative because that spoke so deeply to me about this idea of the fire and how fire can both consume and destroy or it can warm and comfort. And this helps introduce me a little bit to you as well. But the first uh, image I'm wanting to put up is, is this one. Now, that is the burning and the of Notre Dame. And I felt a strange sense of uncontrollable grief about that when Notre Dame caught fire, perhaps because I've had such strong memories of the visit to Paris that my wife Sharon and I made in December 1987. And we spent time in awe in this famous cathedral. And my, our son, Samuel, was three months in Sharon's womb. We were deeply prayerful. A flame burned within. Now, this picture was posted three years ago, when was it, four years ago when Notre Dame caught fire, by a Facebook friend who now has become more than that. She happens to be a Roman Catholic priest, but a woman priest, Diane Wilman. And she saw in the burning of Notre Dame something profoundly significant and serendipitous. I cannot help but feel that there is something deeply significant in this tragic event. What is this sign for our times? Indeed, the fire has blazed within its structures, like the fire that has burned in wombs that have been desecrated. It has raised history and tradition that kept its people entombed. I cannot help but remember the words, I have heard my people's cry. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. These are our words too. In its tragedy, lies the smouldering coals of renewal. I remain even more committed to my call as a Catholic woman priest to continue sharing the holy sacraments as if they could be the personal property of some men contained in prisons, not tabernacles. I remain committed to Mass action, to release the fire that burns with liberation, to know deeply that we have the weapons of mass construction, that is, our faith, and the gift of oppression and suffering now turned into a fire that will not go out. Indeed, Our Lady has burned, now she is free. This is Holy Week, in its most truest resemblance. The temple has been torn down. In three days, 
it will be rebuilt. Well, a fire needs a keeper of the flame to ensure it warms and comforts but doesn't burn and consume. And in preparing for this dialogue, I asked another friend of mine, uh, Leonie Joubert, a science writer who has hugely influenced me in my understanding of the science of climate change with her book Scorched and in her writing on the Daily Maverick, Our Burning Planet series. I asked if she had any questions for you. She hadn't read your book yet, but this is a question she poses. How does one not get utterly crushed with despair? I know the answer will be hope, Joanna Macy, et cetera, et cetera. But if it were that simple, we wouldn't be feeling crushed with despair. How do you respond to that, Dougal? Well, I think often hope is offered as an antidote to despair or a way of avoiding it, postponing it. And one of the things that comes to mind for me as I look at that image of Notre Dame is I, I have a very strong memory of that week because that was the, the week in which Extinction Rebellion had taken to the streets of London. And a day before the fire at Notre Dame in Paris, outside St. Paul's Cathedral in London, there had been a, a gathering of representatives of all kinds of religious traditions. And there were various people who were there. My friend Sarah Zoltash was there. I remember seeing a photo of her standing next to Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, there was an image of St. Paul's with flames in the background that was used on one of the banners that was carried at that, at that demonstration that day. And so within 24 hours to then see across the channel in what is in some strange sense, the twin city of London, Paris, to see an, an actual um, burning of a great historic, beautiful building and building with lots of complex resonances for lots of different people as, as the passage that you read suggests. Well, maybe it's an image of quite how strange a kind of hope might be called for if there is hope today, that it's not about avoiding despair, it's about passing through despair, allowing ourselves to be changed. Something that Paul Kingsnorth and I would often say in the early years of Dark Mountain was you know, what we were learning with that project was that despair is not a thing to be avoided at all costs. Mm. You know, there can be a danger that activism becomes a way of distracting ourselves from what we know in our hearts in the middle of the night, a way of trying to avoid being called into question and being changed. And as I think you and I both have learned from dialogue with Alistair, there is another kind of activism which is born out of a surrender, out of a, you know, allowing ourselves to be carried by something larger than us that we will never fully know or understand or see the end of. Mm -hmm. Um, but that in order to do that, we might have to pass through the dark night of the soul, to pass through the point where we let go of our hopes. Remember those lines now from T.S. Eliot, I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. That any hope worth having lies on the far side of being so changed that we become other than who we are in the world that we've been part of, the world that is ending. So oh, by the end of this book, which is called At Work in the Ruins, and so they, you know, again, that, that image of the burning church is such a, um, an, an evocation of what ruins can mean or one of the things that ruins can mean. By the end of the book, I say that what's called for is not, you know, it's not to try and make sustainable the ways of living of the Western middle classes. It's to negotiate the surrender of those ways of living. And then I come back to this word surrender. I say, so surrender not to the kind of dark certainty that sometimes comes in once we let go of belief in the promises that we can fix climate change, that it's a problem that can be dealt with and made to go away and we can get to have some kind of continuation of the promises and trajectories of modernity. 
surrender not to the certainty, to the kind of black certainty of knowing how the story ends, which is the flip side of that belief in the promises and trajectories. Surrender to the mystery, Mm -hmm. to the strangeness of not knowing how the story ends, that our agency doesn't require us to know the world from above in some omniscient godlike way in order to act in some powerful and controlling way, that actually that is a, a delusion and we have to find our way back to a humbler way of knowing the world as something we are part of and acting in it as part of it rather than acting on it with plans and designs and schemes and projections. And so somehow that is what we're being called into by all of this trouble which climate change is, is a part of. Mm-hmm. Two thoughts about this last year before I ask you to share whatever images you wish about the burning of Notre Dame. Now, Fiona pointed out to me that the fire started as a consequence of a restoration effort. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somebody, something went wrong in trying to somehow repair the building. And I thought that was an interesting irony because a large part of your book is saying we've got to let go of this belief that modernity and technology and that that cleverness that we have can help save things. That was what actually destroyed them. So I felt that was significant. And the other thought, which you might might not want to respond to, is that because Notre Dame is such a big tourist attraction, we heard all sorts of attempts to try and fast track its restoration so that tourists would come back. So it was, again, trying to control to, to try and take hold of. Now, I can have, I have empathy for politicians and President Mitterrand and everyone else because, yes, the economy needs to rely so much on tourism. After all, I was a tourist and, and I loved it. But in your book, you talk about this sense in which, you know, the existing paradigm for dealing with our problems is not, is not cutting it. So say a bit more about science and your deep concern that about how our attachment and addiction to a scientific solution and, and technology and how we need to get beyond that. Well, look, I think the other thing that has to be said as we look at the uh, image there from Notre Dame is that destruction on a far greater scale than that goes on every day without making any headlines or without any massive mobilization. And the, in a sense, part of what part of what the burning of Notre Dame brings into view is something that in the book I talk about using some lines from the anthropologists, Marisol de la Cadena and Mario Blazer, where they are talking about, you know, this talk about the Anthropocene, the new geological epoch brought about by human industrial activity, the industrial activities of certain humans. And they say, you know, heard from elsewhere, and a lot of the people in the book that they're introducing here are are writing from the context of Latin America, heard from elsewhere, all of this urgent talk about the Anthropocene can sound a lot like the world of the powerful, becoming aware for the first time that its world too could end Mm. after having gone around the world, ending so many worlds and calling it progress. Mm. And so part of what we're looking at when we look at the kind of the horror and the urgent response to the destruction of a European cultural icon like Notre Dame is how much destruction of so many other cultures and cosmologies has gone on and been written into, either written out of the story altogether, or written into it as a necessary part of this journey of progress that was narrated from cities like Paris and London. And equally, you know, as we look out across the world, the the scale of the ecological destruction, I mean, It doesn't take a great deal of imagination to stand in any of the great cathedrals in Europe and realize that what you are standing in is a stone forest, that this architecture borrows from the language of trees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, cathedrals work of trees 
of old growth forests are being destroyed every day. And that's part of what feeds and makes possible the ways of living that carry all of the tourists to Paris or London. And oh, equally, the same kinds of destruction are going on increasingly to get at the resources, the metals that are going to be part of the supposedly sustainable way that we get to carry on having these lifestyles without all of the carbon emissions. And so the book, you know, I'm clearly writing to call those things into question, to bring those things into view. Mm -hmm. And you know, this question of science, part of why I raise that in the book is because after years of working with climate scientists and talking about climate change in all kinds of contexts, public and otherwise, I found myself saying again and again, climate change asks us questions that climate science cannot answer. And this is not to speak against science, it's just to recognize that the world that we're in is larger than the parts of the world which science is able to describe to us. Mm. And uh, one of those questions is, how did we find ourselves in this trouble? Are we here as a consequence of a piece of bad luck with the atmospheric chemistry, that it turns out seven generations down the line from the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution that the you know, benign climatic conditions of the Holocene, the atmosphere can't sustain those given the amount of CO2 we've been throwing out into it. You know, that's often the way that the story of climate change is told to us. Mm. Or... Do we find ourselves in this trouble as a consequence of a way of approaching the world, a way of seeing and treating everyone and everything that would always have brought us mm -hmm. to such a pass, even if the atmospheric chemistry had been different, even if the IPCC were to turn around next week and say, terribly embarrassing, turns out we did our sums wrong. You can throw up all the CO2 you want and it's not going to destabilize the climate. You know, they're not going to do that. But my point is that as long as we talk as if it's just a matter of uniting behind the science, following the science, or even stranger, believing in science, you know, treating it as an object of belief, as long as we think that science can do all of the work of knowing the world and telling us what to do, we don't even get to ask questions like that about how we found ourselves in this trouble. And what happens if those questions are not asked? is that they're still answered implicitly. They're answered in ways that serve the interests of, you know, the powers and principalities, that serve the interests of those who have most vested in least changing. And science and technology gets put into service of that, and, and it all becomes a project of how do we keep the world as we know it at all costs, as if that's desirable or possible. So these are the kinds of things that I'm trying to open up in the book to say we have to stop asking science to do all of the work. You know, there's a long history of asking too much of science. And we have to bring to the table other parts of the story, other ways of asking questions and answering them, the work of judgment, as well as the work of measurement, if we're going to have a chance of, you know, finding paths through the ending of the world as we knew it and into worlds that we can't yet imagine that will nonetheless be worth living for and that we have a chance of contributing to the viability of. Mm. Uh, Dougal, do you have a photo that you would like to share now? Let's see if that experiment... I do. Let's, let's see if I can do this. So what's lovely here is that we didn't tell each other anything about the pictures <laughs> we were going to be sharing. And so there you had Notre Dame turning to ruins. And this, which you might recognize, John, is Iona Abbey. <laughs> it was rebuilt from ruins in the 20th century. Mm. And I chose this photo because it's both something that's there in my family history. I mean, I can remember visiting Iona Abbey twice as a child and you know, being taken on these holidays around the coasts of Scotland. And it's there in Alistair's story. It's there in that book, Soil and Soul, that we started with. Mm. And there's a particular passage in that book, which means a good deal to me, where Alistair is on his way 
to Ronyaval, to the the sacred mountain that's going to be destroyed by the super quarry that's going to be built there. And he's bringing this First Nations warrior chief from Canada. His name's Chief Stone Eagle, isn't it? Mm. And they are due to come across to Iona as one of the stops on their journey up the coast. But they get to Mull and there's a great storm and the ferry isn't running. And Stone Eagle's wife says to Alistair quietly, you know, look, you realize that taking him to this Christian holy site, this is, this is not an easy thing for him. You know, he's coming out of the generations in Canada for whom the, you know, the theft of children by church schools that took them away and attempted to erase, you know, attempted cultural genocide of their, their culture and their tradition was lived experience, mm. you know, the full depths of the horrors of which have been revealed since mm. that story, since Alistair wrote the book. But the next morning, they make the journey across to the island. And Stone Eagle says, I didn't know you had places like this. You know, he sets foot on this island and he recognizes the sacredness of this place, which is a sacredness that's bound up in the rocks and the soil and the grass, as well as in what has been built there and in all of the prayers that have been said under the, the roof of these buildings over many centuries. So that's the first thing he says. He says, I didn't know you people had places like this. And then he turns and the force of the anger comes out. If you had places like this, how could you come to our places and do the things that you did? Mm. And to me, you know, I feel very lucky that my first encounter with these questions of you know, decoloniality, of the reckoning with history, the reckoning with unfinished history in the language that I used in that passage you asked me to read, came from somebody who's, you know, of about my father's generation coming from a part of the world not far from where some of my ancestors came from. You know, I didn't meet it first, coming from the far side of the world, being spoken by people who looked very different to me and spoke different languages to me. It came to me first from somebody from Scotland telling these stories, that was Alistair, but somebody who was deeply involved already in these encounters across the Atlantic and around the world with other places that had been touched by the damage that was done in the name of salvation, in the name of development, in the name of you know, modernization. Progress. Mm. Progress. And so, you know, this invitation to indigeneity comes in this troubled and troubling set of stories of encounters like the one that happens when, mm -hmm. when Stone Eagle and Alistair mm -hmm. set foot on the island of Iona. And I, I feel increasingly a call to stay with the trouble of that, you know, not to, I, I see people for understandable reasons, wanting to wash their hands of their own culture, their own history, their own traditions, the things that their ancestors believed, mm. wanting to reach right back into prehistory and find something purer, something before the damage that they see represented by the institutions. And I, you know, we see the institutions in ruins, whether it's you know, dramatically like Notre Dame burning down, or whether it's just, you know, the the closure of more and more of the churches in countries across Europe. And, you know, that's, that's what needs to happen. That's the moment in the story that we're in. Mm -hmm. But there's something strange going on amongst the ruins of that. There are all sorts of questions that I hear coming from people who 10 years ago would not have, you know, would have been put off this conversation by the fact that we both started by bringing images of churches and talking about the ruination and the rebuilding of them 
who are maybe ready to ready to hear that there might be something worth talking about, something worth gathering around among the ruins of our institutions and our traditions, even in you know the parts of the world from which projects of coloniality and modernization began and spread out around the world, doing so much damage along the way. So that was that was the first of the images that came to mind for me to to bring to the table and share with you today. Did I tell you that that Alistair couldn't participate today because he's taking a group to Iona Abbey? <laughs> no, you hadn't told me that. Of course he is. Bless him. <laughs> said, Sorry, John, I'm taking a group to Iona. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> There's kind of some things up here. Um, yeah, that's very powerful. And I, you know, I always feel like, you know, I need to take off my shoes because we are on sacred ground now. You know, there's a sense in which uh, there's something wonderful happening. The I want to share a photograph which also, for me, was a threshold experience. Now, that is also a ruin, and it's a ruin of a salt factory in the coast of Somalia. And in 2005, after the Asian tsunami, I was working for the World Health Organization. We were working on humanitarian crises in Southern Africa. And then the tsunami struck, and it went with such devastating force right across the Indian Ocean, and there were some 170 people drowned in Somalia, a couple others in Kenya as we go down the coast. So devastating was this force of nature. But what really was perturbing to me is that the first thing I encountered as we awoke in the early morning to see the devastation was this shark its fins had been chopped off, its liver had been taken out. And I was really startled. And then I learned from my uh, colleagues in WHO that it's common practice on the coast for sharks to basically be caught, the fins and liver taken out, and the carcass just dumped into the ocean. And it was very disturbing because... I'd come to see what the ocean had done to the people. And the uncomfortable thought occurred to me that, well, what have the people been doing to the ocean? A tsunami is a natural disaster or a natural emergency. Um, it, there's no human causation there. There was a massive mobilization of concern about what to do there. I mean, even... You know, we had no difficulty raising money for this. But I, was, I had in mind a reflection from Thomas Berry, you know, the eco-theologian, where he talked about the great conversation that we have forgotten, the conversation we need to have with the universe, with the other species. And he used a term which um, he says we, there's almost a sense in which We've developed what he called spiritual autism. Now, I say that with sensitivity to those who are neurological diverse, because I am as well. <laughs> but I shared that with a colleague in WHO, and he said that is such a good explanation for the state of the World Health Organization as being a state of organizational autism, mm -hmm. as being a sense in which we have disconnected part of our brain. Now, I'm very envious of you because you had the privilege of already having a conversation with another great teacher of mine, uh, Ian uh, McGilchrist. My sense is that in the emergence of a new consciousness, the hope that I derive is that at least we can use these images and we can use these stories and these narratives to say what's really going on deep down just to say that it was on my return from Somalia uh, in 2005 that I was felt, feeling a terrible sense of disillusionment, not sure where I was going, 
And that's where I found suddenly myself sucked, saying, well, how can we dig where we stand? And how can we <laughs> stand in a place where we can dig? And that's how I found myself getting involved with the Amadeva, <laughs> who, but paradoxically, were not interested in any digging. They were not interested in their land being destroyed for titanium. But I felt that at least I could get involved in a localized context and see what could be done within that context. And that really was for me, the as a consequence of me traveling around Africa and just having no confidence in the way in which our institutions were ever going to be able to get to grips with the challenges. Thoughts about that? Well, as you speak about your experiences with the World Health Organization, I think of people I've met inside other international and national institutions where it became clear to me through our conversations that they had reached a a kind of crisis of faith in the promises that their institutions made. And again, I'm thinking particularly because it's the kind of conversation that I've often been drawn into around climate change. And so what I was beginning to meet was people who no longer believed in the promise that we could save the world, fix climate change, build a sustainable future that their institutions were making, but who were stuck because it was as if they'd lost their faith, but not questioned the theology. Mm that that faith was structured around. They still thought of the world as something in need of saving and in need of saving by people like them working within institutions like theirs. Mm -hmm. And I think the move that you describe is actually the the critical one, the turning aside, Mm -hmm. that language of digging where you stand, which Alistair uses at the beginning of Soil and Soul, realizing that rather than attempting to, you know, create global institutions and projects that can project power and authority and the ability to fix things across a a conception of the world as a whole, that in order to participate in, in order to return to being part of the world, we have to find scales of action that are proportionate to the kinds of creatures we actually are, and that tends to involve being in place, though it doesn't preclude also being connected from place to place. That's also an important part of the work that is called for. And this makes me think that I should actually show you my next mm-hmm. image. Here we go. So this is me sitting at a cafe in Oaxaca City, and it must be, gosh, 2011, coming to the end of a very enjoyable lunch with. Gustavo Esteva, who you can see there, sat across the table from me, and a couple of friends who had brought me to to Oaxaca. Now, in order to tell you about Gustavo, and in order to to weave his story into what we've just been talking about there, including your story with the WHO, I need to take a few steps back. Mm. I need to go back to, well, maybe back as far as how I found my way to Alistair and Soil and Soul in the first place. Mm. which was that an archbishop told me to uh, look into shamanism. Mm. I was interviewing Rowan Williams. Now, this was a year or so before he became Archbishop of Canterbury, but he was already the Archbishop of Wales at that point in time. I was a lowly journalism student. He very kindly, at the end of a long day, agreed to sit down with me for 20 minutes and do an interview for my student project. And before that, he'd given this this lecture on poetry and faith. And among many other things, he talked about the Corpus Christi Carol, the strange medieval text. Um, And I knew it originally from Jeff Buckley's recording of the the Benjamin Britten Britten setting of the Corpus Christi Carol. Um, But anyway, we've done this interview where I'm asking Rowan about, you know, actually about the sort of uh, the decline of, church going and religious belonging and you know where all of this is headed and i switch off the microphone and we're walking out together and we're talking about poetry because i'd studied english literature at university and i said i did i was really glad that you spoke about the corpus christi carol it's such a a strange beautiful text and he said oh yes and he said no you should really look at it as a shamanic text 
<laughs> and a few months later, I was in my first short-term contract at the BBC, and it was a quiet evening in the newsroom. I was on a late shift, and I started Googling shamanism and the Bible, and somehow I found my way to this text by this guy I'd never heard of called Alistair McIntosh, where he was reviewing a couple of contemporary books about you know, shamanic practices, and he was relating this to um, stories from the Bible, Elijah and Elisha and Ezekiel and these kind of Old Testament experiences. And I'm reading this and going, wow, they never told us about this in Sunday school. And so that was the first time I'd ever come across Alistair's name. Mm -hmm. Now, roll forward another half year or so, and I had, had tumbled out of my first job at the BBC realized that maybe I didn't want to spend my life in newsrooms and was therefore having to work out what I was going to spend my life doing. And at that point in time, I was taking temporary jobs in call houses and call, yeah, warehouses and, um, you know, call answering places for banks and so on, just to earn bits of money and coming home and spending my evenings reading books that I got from the library. And on a library shelf in Plymouth, I found this book, Soil and Soul, and recognized the name. I'd already come across this Alistair McIntosh guy. And I started reading it, and there are various things within it that sort of lodged deep within me, and you know, so that I can truthfully say that there's, you know, I, I don't know who I would be if I hadn't read that book. But one of the things was, Alistair was describing his childhood in the Isle of Lewis, and the, the kind of economy that still existed in the 60s there. And he describes how you know, it was a year when the fishermen had been on strike, so no one had much money. And someone was having, their, uh, you know, having a bungalow built, and all of the guys were pitching in and building this together. And, and I asked the system, how can, how can Jimmy afford to, to have a new house built? And they said, oh, well, you know, Last year, when it was somebody else who needed a uh, building done, he pitched in with us, and that's just how it works. So they were all clubbing together mm -hmm. to make life work. You, know, you went out fishing, and no one had refrigerators. So on the way back, if you caught a good catch, you stopped at each house and gave someone something. And this was, this was the world that Alistair was born into the tail end of in the Hebrides. Mm -hmm. And he referred to this as the vernacular economy. And this was something that came from this guy called Ivan Illich. Mm. Now, Ivan Illich, I then started to explore more deeply into his work and discovered these books like Deschooling Society and Medical Nemesis and Tools for Conviviality that he'd written in the 70s, when for a while he had a very high profile internationally, this kind of radical former Catholic priest, social critic. Mm. Gradually, I began to get drawn into the world of Illich's friends and collaborators. He was no longer around, but there were people like Gustavo who had known him and worked with him. And Gustavo had this story where he had been born in Mexico in the, the 1930s, and his father was a white Mexican, his mother was indigenous. She thought the best thing that she could do for her children was to spare them the stigma of indigeneity so she wouldn't let her mother come through the front door of the house or speak to her grandchildren in their traditional language. And Gustavo ends up, as a teenager, his father dies and he has to go out to work to support the family and he rises very quickly in this first era of the American corporations coming into Mexico. So by his early 20s, he's a, an executive at IBM. And he ends up walking away from all of that. Because he says, you know, there was this bright, shining promise of development, but I could see the reality was everything was being done to look after the interests of the bosses, not the workers. Mm -hmm. So then he goes off and he becomes a Marxist guerrilla fighter. And he spends a number of years deeply involved in this guerrilla group. And his, he said to me when we had this conversation in Mexico, you know, this was the era of Che. This was what you did. But after a few years, he witnessed murder of one of the leaders within the group that he was part of by another of the leaders in a fight over somebody's girlfriend. And he said, it was a revelation of the violence that we wanted to unleash on society. And I realized I couldn't be part of that. So he'd say that was the second turning of his life. The third turning came when he was about the age that I am now. He was in his mid forties. And by this point, 
he was a senior civil servant in Mexico City, working in a government ministry, running these programs across the country. And he, uh, the, the, the politicians of that government were friends of his. You know, they were people with their hearts in the right place as far as he could see. And in 1976, there was a new government forming led by the same president and Gustavo was invited to become a cabinet minister. And he turned it down and walked away. And he said, I couldn't explain to anyone or even to myself why I was walking away. I just knew that I had to because I knew from what I had seen over the years in those rooms that even with people of goodwill in government, the interests of the government and the interests of the people are never the same. They don't see the world the same way. And the things that we try to do from those offices up there don't play out the way that we imagine them in the communities. And so he went and he got involved in grassroots movements and organizations in the barrios in Mexico City. And it was through that that he finally found his way to, to the work of Illich and others. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I chose this picture because it's one of a number of encounters for me that were incredibly import important and formative that shaped what I'm writing about and the stories that I'm telling in, in the book with people who came from other parts of the world, whose stories I was better able to understand because of what I'd already been led into by reading Alistair's story from Scotland. But here I was hearing from Oaxaca or from you know, Palestine or India. I was hearing stories about what it had been like, what it was still like to be in communities that were on the receiving end of projects of modernization. People for whom modernity was not a heroic story of what we do, but an experience of having things done to them for their own good under a sequence of different names and, and logics. And that was part of what began to give me clues to make sense of what was missing from the stories that I had grown up with, the, the stories that the society I was born into liked to tell about itself. And so these, you know, these conversations, you know, I recorded filmed a set of conversations with Gustavo, and part of that was published in one of the Dark Mountain books. And that was part of a sequence of these dialogues with thinkers and activists around the world that were part of help, how what helped me, sort of gave me the, the ability to retell the story of how we found ourselves here and what might be worth doing given where we find ourselves in ways that didn't necessarily fit with all of the aspects of even what the you know, the activists around me and the climate movements that I've been part of in Europe were talking about. And what comes to mind um, in our work in the Wild Coast, initially the organisation that we had formed in 2002, I think it was, was called Save the Wild Coast. Um, and it was very much structured on an idea that human agency, we with, with mobilization, media, blah, 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 we can actually save the wild coast. And there had been a previous fight uh, over titanium deposits on the north coast of KwaZulu-Natal, which we had won. And I say we, the environmental movement, stopped the – successfully ensured that an area that was proclaimed to be a, a nature reserve rather than – uh, to allow mining to happen. So that was that history. However, we came to a point where we said, we went away in 2006, a group of us, um, and reflected deeply on it, led by Bishop Jeff Davies, who was the Anglican bishop of the Diocese of Umzumbubu, which included this stretch of coastline. And he, uh, as a bishop, had seen his work very much as a very inclusive thing and that the natural environment was God's creation and this was something which he took very seriously, his you know, accountability for stewardship. But we, we, we had a shift then. We said, hang on, we can't call ourselves Save the Wild Coast. We've got to – and we called ourselves in Sustaining the Wild Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, and the shift there was to say, well – it's not our energy that's going to save it from outside. It's going to be connecting with the latent creative synergistic potential of the life forces there. And we were having our strategic planning thing in the most spectacular place you could ever imagine. 
uh, Waterfall Bluff, where we have this incredible thing. Uh, you know, you know the confrontation between ocean and the and 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 the continents, and the incredible salt spray that flies up. And uh, there's one nearby. We took a walk to a place where a river flows straight into the sea, and there are only something like twelve places in the world where there's a cliff face that has a river flowing straight into the sea. And 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 it, it, with that consciousness, we said, well, this is. We've experienced it. How do we ensure other people understand it? So the whole logic was to say, well, we instead of just cursing the darkness, let's light the candle, let's encourage tourism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And a whole series of really wonderful serendipities happened. The, the king and queen of the Amampondo, who is their traditional area, invited us to get involved, and we, they supported us, and we became very close and successful. However. I mean, in fact, so successful that the same community have been leading the struggle to stop Shell from their seismic exploration on the Wild Coast. And we've now successfully got a halt to that as well. Um, but as I'm now thinking, sus sustainable, sustaining, and the whole critique of sustainability is... <laughs> Not sustainable, excuse the tautology in that, but there's something about if we just keep things sustaining development and that whole dreadful, sad turn after the Rio Earth Summit where, you know, with the Brundtland report and how we really thought that we were into a new consciousness, but the whole thing became how do you sustain development rather than sustaining society? And I'm just wondering whether we need to go into another conversation and saying we need to change the word from sustaining the wild coast to surrendering the wild coast. Now, that's something which <laughs> once you've grown attached to it, you're saying we've got to almost like let go. Um, and it's a train of thought which is just emerging to say because the way things are at present, it's this very adversarial oppositional thing. Yeah, we are, there's Shell, there's the mining company in Australia. Um, well, we want to say that this is a planet that sustains you too. Mm -hmm. And somehow the, the polarization that tends to happen, the dichotomization that tends to occur when things get framed in terms of a binary. And I have a sense that that was also the experience that part of your own disillusionment that led to you and for, uh, forming Dark Mountain Project and just saying there needs to be a shift. Give me some guidance on how <laughs> I'm going to – I can't say sell this. How can I share this with my colleagues <laughs> who for 20 years have been trying to sustain the wild coast? And the reason I say this is because right now, neighboring the, uh, the, the mining area, it is a wonderful tourism uh, nature reserve. And they wanted to sell a concession to some tourism agency, which is going to now sell very luxury five million rand villas and stop the local community from enjoying the beaches. So this is a tourism initiative, which is – and I was talking to Alistair about that because he's telling me that in Scotland – there's now with the whole, you know, his land reform that was sparked by the successful struggle in the Isle of Egg is that they're now turning these wilderness and sort of areas and they want people to be moved out so they can actually uh, plant uh, for carbon sequestration and carbon credits and trade them on the futures market. So, this, <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, now where do we go from here? Mm. There's, a, there's a work of discernment there, isn't there, which you already went through once in that journey from saving to sustaining and you know, what you're noticing is that maybe there is a a further step in that journey which won't necessarily be you know just because for the particular purposes of the the journey that i'm narrating in the book the the move from sustaining to surrendering makes sense that's not necessarily the language that you're looking for but what i hear in that journey that you've described already is the the recognition that agency is larger and stranger and more diverse than we often start out as assuming 
you know, part of part of the despondency of some of the people I was encountering who were sort of stuck within these institutional contexts without having made that move to step away from that and to dig where you stand that you described or that Gustavo models in that moment where he turns away from his government career is the assumption that the agency lies entirely with the humans mm -hmm. and actually with a particular subset of humans, the ones who look most developed, the ones who live closest to the future and the logic of modernity. And, you know, you and I, we, we know that something important is missing from that, that story. And so when you say, you know, all of the energy couldn't come from us, mm -hmm. it's that recognition that the coast itself has a say, that this living place and all of the creatures within it and involved with it have a say. And so your work is getting involved with it. And I think of you know, another of the passages in Soil and Soul that profoundly affected me at 25 when I first read it, which is where Alistair is describing how Tom Forsyth introduced him to Wu Wei, this Taoist understanding of doing through not doing. And what Tom's saying to him, you know, this is in the early stages of the campaign that led to the buyout of the Isle of Egg and to the land reform in Scotland. And Alistair's fretting that they're not managing to do enough, they're not getting enough done. And, and Tom says, look, you know, we could exhaust ourselves trying to do this using our own energy. And the forces we're up against wouldn't even notice us. The only way we get to do this is if we allow forces much larger than us. And here we are talking about the land and the life and the place and the culture and everything passing through it. We allow those forces to work with us. And then the work is not trying to generate all of the energy and the power. The work is just looking for the moment to act in such a way that all of that can come into play. Mm. So you know, it's not to deny that we find ourselves up against forces that need to be resisted. You know, that is part of the story. But the way in which that resistance plays out will often turn out to be stranger than the ways we draw the lines between us and them make it look. Mm -hmm. And the moves that are required often look like giving up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what Gustavo was doing in each of those turnings in his life. He was giving up on something he could no longer believe in without being able to explain mm -hmm. to people why. And that's why I recognized so much in his story from the experience that Paul and I had been through with Dark Mountain, because when we first wrote the manifesto, people would say to us, look, you guys, you know, you're burnt out. We get it. Just go away. Like maybe go off and spend three months on a beach in Thailand or something. I don't know. And then maybe you'll be able, ready to come back and do another round. Or maybe it'll be time for you to move to Devon and retrain as an acupuncturist. <laughs> but they're saying, you know, don't go around shouting about the fact that you've given up and trying to encourage other people to give up. And somehow out of that, this language of giving up was given to me and I had to carry it around and work out what I understood by it, what it meant to me. And in that process, I realized that there was more to it than this. Mm -hmm. That, you know, again, if you look at Gustavo's story, the reason he couldn't answer the question of why he was giving up at the point where he turned down that job in government was because the possibilities that lay outside of that mode of action, that model of agency, were invisible mm -hmm. from the vantage point of the rooms that he was sitting in. You have to walk away and go somewhere else mm -hmm. and be there long enough that your eyes begin to adjust, that you begin to see things from where you are now rather than where you have been used to spending your life and your work in order for other possibilities, possibilities that were hidden from you to come into view. And those are the kinds of journeys that I think we're invited on once we stop pretending that if we just mine the right stuff rather than the wrong stuff, we can fix climate change and get a sustainable future. You know, if we realize that the transition that's being called for is not simply a transition from fossil fuels to a cleaner version of industrial modernity, 
but a transition from the whole you know, extractivist approach to places and soil and rocks mm -hmm. and also to people and communities and culture you know that's a far deeper journey yeah. we can't we can't even imagine all of it mm -hmm. I, I think that fully imagining and stepping into and finding the agency that's called for by that mm -hmm. is only going to be possible once we stop trying to be the only source of agency well the Especially other Fascinating thing you mentioned, Tom Forsyth. What really gave me inspiration was uh, Alistair describes how this guy would come and talk to students at the Center for Human Ecology and would draw on the on the blackboard a tree, and then its root structure. And you make the point that that amount of biomass that we know is a tree that there's as much below ground as there is above ground. And then he used the meta as a metaphor. He says, don't just go to the grassroots, go to the tap roots, because at the grassroots, people, you know, live kind of lives of getting drunk and carrying on. And they said, there's something deeper. And if you protect the tap roots or an area, the tree will flourish. The, the, there will be a, a healing, a restoration. And I then thought, well, that's now obviously the metaphor I needed to use. I'm not there as John Clark, this stale, pale male, simply trying to extend my shelf life because I'm disillusioned with what's happening. I'm there to simply provide a support and protection so that the tap roots could then be protected and grow. And that, mm. that sense, and that, and that is what happens. And I found myself in all sorts of strange ways um, because I don't even speak the language, which was an advantage in some ways because it meant that I couldn't talk too much, <laughs> had to shut up, rely on translators, and then found myself because I was wanting to talk to the elders, having young people who spoke English, the elders didn't. And in the process of them interpreting, suddenly a shared consciousness arising about the fact that the, the young people who were leading the, anti, the struggle against the mining were now drawing on these deeper wells of ancient wisdom from their elders, which because of education and, and, and the fact the elder people couldn't speak, they felt marginalized. Now they were participating. So that was a wonderful thing. And, um, you know, when people always think, gee, John, you really do um, seem to be able to work miracles. I said, no, no, no. I might give the appearance that I can walk in water. But all I'm doing is I know where the stepping stones are just below the surface. And I'm picking my way ahead and then going back and forth between Johannesburg and the Wild Coast in order to ensure that there is an awareness of what's happening. And that's how it all worked out. So, so in a sense... There was a surrender of my saviour complex, my messianic complex, my need to do it, and just to allow a process to unfold. And it's been, paradoxically, so much more empowering for me. And I'm especially a powerful person being empowered because of that sense of surrender. You become a trafficker between worlds. <laughs> What's your last picture? Have you had another one? Last picture. Let's find it. Um, my last picture, a little bit like your picture of the shark on the beach. This is also a picture that might conjure up a certain sense of distaste or even horror, but it's um, by no means the worst kind of intensive chicken farming. But this is a glimpse of some intensive more modern chicken farming and these birds that will probably never see light apart from the artificial light that you can see coming in from the roof there. And this came to mind because one of the images that I use in the book comes from Munir Fasha, a Palestinian mathematician and educational activist. And he's talking about, well, I guess this thing that we've touched on a few times of modernity. But he's talking about it from the particular angle of the learned helplessness <laughs> that characterizes modernity. And he's describing a saying that exists in Palestinian villages in the Galilee, 
where they'll say of somebody who has this helplessness that tends to come with being highly educated in a modern society, he's like an Israeli chicken. Mm. Because historically, at least, the Israeli chickens within that contested and troubled part of the world have been, you know, modern birds bred for being kept inside artificially lit buildings that have been bred to the extremes of egg production or meat production. And, you know, as he says, you know, they, they need all sorts of different jabs in order to stay alive and special feeds that are manufactured by particular corporations and the rest of it. And they'll stop laying if they don't get all of those inputs. Whereas the Palestinian birds are traditional breeds that peck around in the dirt, that will eat their own shit if they need to, that know how to exist with very little in the particular landscapes that they've been bred in for a very long time. And, you know, that is a pattern that you can find. I talk about other examples in the book. I talk about an example from southern India where um, it's Ram Subramanian who is describing um, the difference between the dairy farms. We're talking about very small dairy farms. The difference between the ones that are run by um, the villagers in traditional ways and the ones that are run by NGOs that are staffed by people who've been to university. And he says, you know, in the village farms, it's obvious that, you know, when there is a funeral in the village, I, the ordinary work of the day is rearranged around that because you, know, you, you don't even need a because, it's just the natural course of events. The, they, they are part of the life of the community. Whereas in the NGO-run farms, they're oriented towards being you know, inputs towards a supply chain, and any interruption of that is either kind of invisible or it's visible only as a nuisance, only as an interruption of this logic of production. And so it's this attempt to sort of discern and not least to notice that there is a precariousness that comes with the, you know, the more developed, the more highly modern ways of doing things. Because yes, they're super productive, but if one thing goes wrong in terms of the inputs, they stop working. Whereas the ways of doing things that have been around for a very long time have had to be super resilient in order to survive through hard times, in order to work with the unpredictability, the lack of control over the situation. And so there's an invitation there again to look at different forms of agency, and not least for those of us who are you know, the carriers of a great deal of privilege, the beneficiaries of modernity, the people who've been born into the winnings, into its shiny side rather than its shadow side, not just to acknowledge that shadow and you know, to take on guilt over it, because you know, apart from as a passing thing, guilt is rarely helpful. Like unless you do something with your guilt, then it can just become a way of recentering you in the story. Mm. But to recognize as well our ridiculousness, our foolishness, our helplessness, our cluelessness, mm. how being products of modernity and of its most advanced forms and institutions makes us more like these factory farm chickens that wouldn't survive long if someone opened the door of the factory farm than like the birds that are pecking around in the Palestinian village and that know how to survive. And that invites us into a humbler relationship rather than getting trapped into the saviour complex. And it also yeah. invites us to, you know, to recognise that the agency in terms of who knows what's needed, in terms of who's going to find ways of making life work as things get harder, as climate change plays out, might not lie with the people who are usually put at the centre of the story, the people who are usually meant to be the forerunners, the ones who are showing the way towards the way that the future is going to look, because those people, us, might turn out to be among the, the most helpless and unable to adapt unless we're unless we're careful, unless we're ready to be humble, unless we're ready to realize that there are huge amounts of skills that we need to learn that 
uh, most of our ancestors would have taken for granted. That really does carry those two modes of developmental engagement, if we can call it that. And the last, to finish off and to wrap things up, I'm going to share with you now my last uh, image. And I have to say in prefacing it, I am so envious of you uh, living in Sweden and where you talk about in your book your trips to Uppsala. Uh, the Dach Hammarskjöld Foundation, which is based there, uh, it was through them that Anne Hope introduced me to the work of Manfred Max Nierf, who was writing his book at the Dach Hammarskjöld Foundation. By the way, this is nice, beautiful symbol you have here. It's a very beautiful uh, design. Well, it's 1,000 years old. And I discovered it about 25 years ago uh, when I was in exile from General Pinochet here in Sweden. I discovered the Viking runic stone. And I was working these concepts. And suddenly I said, my God, I mean, this is the perfect symbol for the harmony that should exist between human beings, nature, and technology, so that none overwhelms the other and to generate a perfect harmony between an interdependence between the three. This is where there's another interesting epistemological connection that you and I share with people in the Latin American context, what you've described of Gustavo's experience in helping conscientize you and become aware. He then saw that as, in a sense, his mandate for his work as an alternative economist, as an ecological economist, of somebody who would took issue with the efficiency logic of, you know, kind of global capitalist and he says, what's about synergy and interdependence? Now, obviously, I was speaking as a Christian, I immediately saw within that a beautiful representation of the Holy Trinity. But then a fascinating thing happened is that I kind of thought, well, that's Manfred's branding. That's his symbol. So we, and on his books, he, he includes it very centrally. And it gives people a normative sense of what he's all about. Another great mentor of mine who happened to be visiting South Africa, and I was hosting him in Cape Town, uh, was Stafford Beer. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Stafford Beer, oh, yes. system model, a man who had also gone through his own experience of paradigm shifting from the efficiencies and the and the power and privilege thing. He was he gave a talk, and um, as a gift to him. I said, uh, I gave him a copy of Manfred's book. I said, Stafford, thank you so much for your enlightenment. Have you read Manfred Max Nierf's work? I want to give you a copy of his book. Held it up for him. And he said, but that's my symbol. <laughs> and the story about 10 years previously, he had been in Uppsala, <laughs> wandering through University Park, had come across this incredible thing, and saw that as being a perfect illustration of the principles of systems and cybernetics and the need for an interdependency, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so I felt, well, and I, he, hadn't, he didn't know about Manfred Max Nierf and Manfred didn't know about Man, uh, Stafford. So I found myself standing on these shoulders of these two giants and feeling this incredible sense of responsibility. I said, for goodness, and now intellectually have tried, looked at their respective writings and finding in them something that's I think can be hopefully for a, any good potential PhD students or someone like that, please, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a question for you to research. And uh, with last point to make just before I ask you to wrap up, you know, my wife had this – who's, you know, got a very good artistic eye. She looked at that symbol and she said, and tried to draw it, and she suddenly realized that it's actually composed of two lines, an inward line and an outward line. So if you were just to take a pencil, you could sketch it very quickly and you could actually draw it out. Mm. I now use it in workshops and uh 
as an icebreaker, and I put it up and I say to folk, please draw this. Hmm. And I ask them, and then I expl- and then I said, then what does it mean for you? How do you interpret it? And then I tell the story of Stafford Beer and Max Neff and myself. So I wanted to say, <laughs> when you next go to Uppsala, uh, instead of telling your students, as you said, we are all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> The very because at the beginning of your book you talk about how you sh- you shocked them when you kind of started out that thing is to say how do they interpret it and there's something in a sense where it becomes you talked about the mystery I've yes. now used that symbol and I, you talked about guilt well mm. the inward line can be the, the 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 personal inward journey of conscience of examination of conscience, me being a good Catholic, now when I go to confession, uh, thinking about my responsibility and failures. And then the outward line is consciousness. So Mm. conscience and consciousness, in a sense, dancing with each other. And Mm. in that sense, people can be inspired to wherever, whatever ruin they find themselves in, well, there's a rune stone (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> R-U-N-E, that hopefully will be a takeaway for them to work it out for themselves. Your final thoughts? Well, I'm clearly going to have to go to Uppsala and uh, do a talk called At Work in the Runes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I love that. That is um, such a rich braided knot of an image and a story. I'm very grateful for that. Well, it feels like we've been we've been dancing in this kind of territory of of serendipity here through this conversation, which is you know one of the secrets, one of the things that can't be seen from the offices where we or people like us gather and attempt to know the world in some complete way, in order to act on the world in some all-powerful way. So long as we're in that space, so long as we're in that mode of approaching the world, we never get to experience the surprise, Mm -hmm. the kindness of strangers, the strange chances that illumine our paths once we have made that move of surrender, made that move of giving up on the attempt to be in control of everything, the attempt to fix everything. And somehow, even with all of the good grounds for despair, as your friend was saying, there is in that experience of the strange and beautiful surprises that come to us once we're, you know, once we've turned aside from the big path the path of control and management. There is a clue that there's more to the story. There's more to come. And I think that's, you know, probably the place where we meet and the place where it would be good for us to to leave people at the end of this conversation. Thank you very much, John. It's been it's been great to to be a guest and to to share these stories and, and images and words with each other.